Well, good morning, teachers. We are so happy that you are with us today. Uh, we know that um, a lot of people are like thinking about this inauguration of the World Cup, but you are here, you know, very focused and wanting to learn a lot about this um, uh, new webinar, which is related with the writing process, something that is so important to, to know how to do and articulate uh, since uh, beginning years. So in order to start again, we have with us Mary Scholl. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, Jonathan Elizondo. Hi, hello everybody. Our facilitator, Samantha Park. Good morning. And uh, Shirley Duarte. Good and morning. Of course, Jaudi. Jaudi is with us today as well. Hello. So in order to, to begin, um, I would like uh, Mary, that is the coordinator of the webinar, to start telling us how we are going to be working today, what is the methodology, and, and uh, when are you going to have your uh, participation as well, how are we going to do it, so Mary. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Um, I'm going to wait for the camera, I'm going to talk until the camera comes to me. <laughs> Hello, camera. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so we're learning how to use this technology. This is an amazing camera that is a smart camera and it will, um, uh, it moves when somebody is talking and so uh, I had to talk for a while for it to come to me. Um, so good morning everybody. If you can hear me, please raise your hands up high and wave really fast and furious. Awesome. Great to see you guys. Um, <laughs> How many of you would have rather been watching the World Cup this morning? Raise your hands. <laughs> oh, I like that somebody in Grande Terra about went like this. <laughs> I know, I wish, I wish I could have changed that, I'm sorry. Um, but thank you for being with us. Um, unfortunately, we can't even sneak in to show you a little bit of it because this is all being recorded, this webinar, and we'll be uploading it, so we have to stay on the up and up. Um, but the Sela is in our hearts, and uh, looking forward to, I'm looking forward to seeing things this afternoon when I have some time to watch the recordings. So, how many of you have been to our webinars on Tuesday and Wednesday this week? Tuesday or Wednesday or both? Raise your hands. How many of you have been to this webinar before with us? No, not very many. And how many of you are new today? Raise your hands. And how many of you aren't sure if you're new today or if you came the last couple of days? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, so we have some new people, which is great. Um, and we have some people who have been here before, so welcome back. Uh, this webinar today is about the writing process. And um, we will be, uh, the way the technology that we have works, you will either see us or you'll see our computer screen. Right, where we have our slides. Um, and we also are using a program called Mentimeter to get you guys to interact with us. So um, throughout the day, uh, throughout the morning, you'll either see us or uh, the slide. At any point, if you need to ask a question, you can either ask your technico or assessor in the room, or you can send us a message through our program where it says ask a question, send us a message and you can ask us a question. Um, and um, let's see, I think that's it to get started. Uh, we will be taking a break at 9.30 for 15 minutes, just so you know. Uh, and at a number of points today, we're actually gonna be doing some writing together so you'll actually have about 10 minutes to write your first draft and 10 minutes to write your second draft. Um, so there will be some times where we black out, you do your work, we do our work, and then we come back together. Um, but we're going to be finishing today at 11.30, just so you know. Um, also, we'll be in this, in this uh, webinar, we'll be asking you for feedback and participation along the way. And at the end, we have some final feedback that is critical to us for our work we need to turn it into MEP, we need to give it to the U.S. Embassy. So we really ask you, please, please, please stick with us to the end and please fill out that feedback at the end. It's, it's really, really important to us. Um, and thank you in advance for doing that. Um, 
So, let's see what else we need to say. I think that's it. I think we can get started with our slides. Oh, great. ourselves. Um, and what I would like us to do is when you introduce yourself, the first thing I want you to say hello and wait till the camera, keep talking until the camera comes to you, you know, say hello, hello, and then give your presentation. So, so um, hello, my name is Mary Scholl. I live in San Ramon in a very small town called El Imbu de Peñas Blancas. I've been living in Costa Rica for uh, full time for about 15, 16 years. Um, and I have had uh, the great honor and joy to do a lot of work with MEP, um, with MEP teachers. And so it's fun to see a lot of people out there that, uh, that I've had a chance to meet, which is really nice. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to, um, to be here today. We're being sponsored by the U.S. Embassy. And MEP has organized it together with my institute, which is called Centro Espiral Maná. So the first person, I'm just going to go down the row. This person is Jonathan Alessandro. Hello, everybody. Hello. So like, I, you can see me there. The camera is looking for me right now. Um, I'm Jonathan Elizondo. I'm a teacher in Escuela Central San Sebastián here in San Jose. I'm originally from Upala. And uh, right now I'm working for uh, Dirección Regional San Jose Central. And it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Thanks to Meb, thanks to Mary and everybody who invited me here for trusting in the work we do. And uh, I hope you benefit from today's uh, webinar as well. Hello, good morning. I'm talking so the camera will find me. Please find me camera, yay! <laughs> <laughs> My name is Samantha Parks. I'm originally from Kansas in the United States, right in the middle of the United States. I am an ESL and EFL teacher and teacher trainer. I have a master's in composition, so teaching writing is my specialty and I get very excited about it. And I hope that you will also get very excited about it. I feel as though writing is the underappreciated and maybe undertaught skill of the four language skills. So hopefully today we'll get to experience the writing process and it'll be more motivating for you to be able to teach it with your students. Um, I also have a master's in TESOL, and I have done teacher trainings in Moldova, Nicaragua, and now Costa Rica. So I'm very happy to be with you. Hello. Um, just keep talking. Talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Shirley Duarte. Uh, I come from Santo Domingo High School. Well, originally I am from Perez de Leon. Uh, very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me and very excited to learn a lot today with all the information that Sam is going to give us. Oh, good morning. Um, I am Ana Isabel Campos. I am also very happy to be here uh, to have the opportunity to, um, with the help of the U.S. Embassy, to reach all the teachers in the, in the country and give them the opportunity to get this type of uh, professional development um, time for you so that you can feel more empowered and more confident to uh, implement the goals that we have in the, in the Costa Rica New English Curriculum. Um, I really hope that you are enjoying this these uh, times and we are also willing to receive your feedback so that every time we develop these type of sessions they respond to what you need. So all your comments that you can give to your regional English advisors will be very helpful because we want to continue using the technology now that we have this tool we can reach the 720 regions without uh, moving people so it's very convenient and we want to maximize this time. So uh, I will let my, my colleague Jaudi to introduce herself now. Hello, um, my name is Jaudi Ramirez and I am a national advisor 
for first and second cycle and it is a pleasure for me to be here and thank you all of you to, to attend this uh, webinar and I hope so that you are going to learn a lot as us also we are going to learn. Uh, thank you for Mary to help us in this uh, transformation and um, thank you. Okay, great. So we're going to go to some slides now that uh, all these slides are available to you just so you all know. Um, we have a folder here and we will give you the link to this folder that has the slides from all three web webinars. So today's webinar is about writing and you'll be able to go in there and you'll be able to find the slides that we're using today. Um, so the first slide is just an abstract about what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be um, discussing how to design writing prompts and model expectations. Um, we're actually going to be doing, we're going to be going through the writing process together and I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, and then we'll also be sharing a little bit of samples of um, some prompts that have been used in both elementary school and high school, some work in high school those grades. Uh, as we mentioned, the webinars are funded by the U.S. Embassy and organized by MEP and Centro Espira Mana. And you had a chance to meet all of us, so we're very excited to be here with you all. In order to get started, we need you to get your, your phones out or your computer out if you're online on the computer and go to menti.com and put in the code 262296. And when you do, when you're in there, give us a thumbs up so that we know you're in there. And we're going to wait and uh, watch and breathe with you uh, to see uh, how many people we have with us on Mentimeter. If you can't get online or if you can't get into Mentimeter, don't worry. You'll still be able to do the whole webinar. Um, you won't be able to sort of interact with us this way, but you can certainly, if you have a question or a need, you can tell somebody in your group who's, who's connected. Um, so great, we got 36 people in there, 39, maybe more, 14 people have given us hearts. Thank you. 42, 44, 45. On our other webinars on Monday, we had, or Tuesday, we had, I think, 265 teachers participating on Mentimeter. And yesterday, we had 320 teachers on Mentimeter, so 300 around there. So that was pretty exciting. I think we're here learning not only about writing and screen casting and um, pronunciation, but also tools like Mentimeter yes. that can be useful, right? Yeah. For our profession or in any other country. So we're, we're learning here not only about pronunciation and about screencasting and writing today, but also we're learning about different uh, tools like Mentimeter that can be used in any of the context we might be working with other teachers, mm -hmm. 
with our students, if you teach older people, mm. um, whatever your contact is, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And this is really important because our world, I imagine, is only going to get more and more technologically connected and not less technologically connected. Mm. So it's good for us as teachers to be on the cutting edge because we're the ones that are shaping and molding the future generations. Okay, let's move forward. Let's move in. We're going to do some practicing uh, with Mentimeter. So we're curious here, what's your experience with Mentimeter? <coughs> hey, we got a lot more people saying Mentimeter is easy. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Maybe they came the last two days. Yeah, okay. that's my guess. We've done it before. In fact, this might show us what percentage of people are new. Yeah. Right, if we have 53 that haven't haven't uh, used it, then they probably weren't here on Tuesday or Wednesday. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. So now you can also see, I, I think, on our screen, we can see we've got 205, 10 people there that have answered, uh, which is exciting to see. Mm -hmm. uh, let it keep running a little bit, because it's still going. Wait till it slows down, and then we'll move on to the next sure. question. Um, so. Now, very interesting that these 244 people are from all over the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to have a question soon where we're going to ask you where you're from. So that'll be fun to see where you all are from. Uh, but we're still getting a lot of answers. So it might be that it takes me to meet a little time to tally all of these answers. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 258, 260. Wow. But it looks like over half of our participants today have never used a Mentimeter, so they're learning a new technology as well as the writing process, which is probably an older technology. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move forward, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. How are you feeling right now? More people sleepy today. <laughs> I mean, it's early in the morning. Oh, yeah, it is early in the morning. Although right now, all these teachers probably would have been Teaching. working with lots of kids and no, yeah. teenagers, right? Don't forget, there will be a coffee break at 9.30, right? <laughs> Well, great to see a lot of you are happy. A few of you are a little grumpy. That's okay. We understand grumpiness. And um, for the 5% that feel like they have money in their eyes and their tongues, um, if you want to share the wealth, we're happy to share with you. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks. We're going to move forward to the next question now. Where are you from? Outside of Costa Rica. That's me. Yeah, right. Oh, you're down here. It's Marriott Sale. And lots in San Jose. Yeah. Juan Agaste. Cucarenas. Right. It's so interesting to see this mm -hmm. We're going to get up at least 300. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah that's fantastic. Well, that means that they are using more Mentimeter. Exactly. More people are using Mentimeter. And I don't know how many are participating that aren't using Mentimeter. That's why I'm curious about the participate, the, the sign-in sheets. But mm -hmm. let's Maybe see if we get up to 300. We're stuck at 294, 95, 96. <laughs> Almost. I'm going to wait till 300 and we're going to go to the next one. Okay, great. <laughs> so we have more than 300 people with us today. That's fantastic. Um, and exciting to see that we are from all over the country. I think this is a, a, is a, a beautiful gift. In the next question, we're going to ask you to put in your name and then the name of the school where you teach. Um, or, the, or the Dirección Regional. That's another good so either your name and then your dirección regional. Um, and so we're going to move on to that question. What's your name and where do you teach? There's 
I love that students is, is the biggest. <laughs> That's beautiful. Kids. So in this particular slide, what we see is the word that's repeated the most gets bigger and bigger. And so as you can see, a student's experience and salary. I think all of those are great things to be grateful for. <laughs> opportunities, it's also a little bigger than all the words. And opportunities. I see the word love, too. That's nice. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of phrases like sharing with my students, students' knowledge, things that are related to students. Mm -hmm. I like the having a job I love. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Helping kids. Great. Oh, thanks so much, y'all. That's really a nice boost of energy this morning. Uh, and again, this slide will be available, so if you want to take a look at it later on, you can. For sure. We've had 310 people respond. Mm -hmm. Wow. Next question. How motivated are you to learn about the writing process today? I think it's important to ask our students about their motivation um, for two reasons. One, as a teacher, I, it helps me understand who I'm working with and where, what they're bringing to the classroom today. Um, because as much as I can spend a lot of time trying to prepare my class and make a beautiful class, if my students come in and they're not feeling motivated, they're feeling down about something, that's something that's out of my control, but if I know about it, I probably will adapt a few things or try and say a few things or just accept the fact that I have 11 people today that really are just not motivated, you know, and, and say, okay, that's part of our reality. Um, so I really appreciate uh, when my students give me their honest answers so I know a little bit more about what, what's, what, what are we starting out with in the classroom. Um, so Exciting to see that uh, people are motivated, really motivated, and some somewhat motivated. And for the not motivated, I'm kind of sorry. Um, I wish I could do something, give you a magic pill or something, but I also understand not being motivated. You know, a lot of times in life we're, we're put, put in situations where 
It's just not what we, we want to do. I always tell, I used to, I taught writing at a university in Japan for, for many years. And it was hard to teach writing to Japanese students uh, because a lot of times people don't like writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I always told my students, like, I'm sorry you're not motivated. In order to pass the course, you still have to do the assignments. <laughs> but I understand that you're not motivated. And that usually helped us have a better relationship. You know, so I always had a good relationship with them, whether they, whether or not they were motivated. So, but great to see we've got 346 answers here. That's incredible. All right. What's your experience using the writing process? I'm going to turn this over to you. It's okay. Yeah. Um, here we want to learn a little bit more about you and where your starting point is. I think one of the tricky parts about teaching writing is many of us are not confident in our own writing abilities and therefore we feel um, a little intimidated by teaching writing. So that's one of our goals today is to try to practice the writing process to help us be more, more confident in our own So, when you think of writing and teaching writing, what words or phrases do you think of? What, what pops into your head? I'm seeing a lot of writing buzzwords, which is good. Things that uh, linking words, brainstorming, vocabulary, drafting, ideas, which tells me that we're all in the right place. I think it's interesting that grammar is the largest word right now. We're going to talk a little bit about grammar, um, but we're also going to talk about how important grammar is in relation to the ideas in the writing. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking a little bit about how uh, creativity is such an important part of writing, mm -hmm. uh, but we often focus on, on the mechanics of the grammar right. and vocabulary right. more than the creativity. I think it's easier to focus on the mechanics. It's hard to teach creativity yeah. and thinking. Obviously, anytime you're doing a piece of writing, you're using your critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And critical thinking is a really difficult skill to teach. Mm -hmm. But through the process of writing, you are continually developing and honing those critical thinking skills. That's Not only for you, but for your students. That's good. We're getting more people. <laughs> We're trending. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so let's think about ourselves as a writer and as a writing teacher. So we have a series of questions to ask you, not at all and yes, through the scale of one to two, I guess. How do you see yourself as a writer? Are you confident? Etc. Well, it's not at all to yes. Oh, but it's from one to ten. One mm -hmm. to ten. Yeah. Because I just want to, want to see the variation. Most people write for work. Mm -hmm. What they do about writing for work. 
Yeah. And that could be lesson planning, that could be writing reports, that could be grading, giving feedback to their students, maybe writing memos. Well, and I see that this workshop is very pertinent because they do not feel so confident when they yeah. have to teach writing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the, I label myself as a writing teacher is um, a little bit lower than the other ones. So, mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting to see that even though many people are throwing up confident writing in English, they are not confident teaching writing. Right, right. That's interesting. So, mm -hmm. so hopefully today through this yeah. workshop you'll feel more confident when you teach writing and teach the writing process. That's one of our goals today is to help you feel more confident and comfortable as a teacher. And the fact of writing for pleasure, right. how we have to promote mm -hmm. writing as something that we can enjoy doing, right? That it's not just homework. Mm -hmm. I taught university writing in Japan, and one of my goals for the course was just that by the end of the course, my students would see that it, it's a possibility that writing could be pleasurable. Right. Because so many people find writing to be hard and difficult and painful, that I wanted to create an experience that would hopefully help them see that it's possible that it could be fun. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so. And through the process of writing, we develop our own ideas. I've heard many people say, well, I don't know what I think about that topic because I haven't written about it yet. Yeah. So the, the fact of sitting down to write your ideas out and to organize them in a way that so that people will understand them actually strengthens the quality of your own ideas and your own arguments. It's really important. Okay, so here are our goals for our workshop today. We are going to experience process writing. We're going to do it. We're going to define it. We're going to discuss how to write assignments, which we're going to refer to as tasks. As we know, task-based learning is what we're going to be working on in our curriculum. Um, and we're going to discuss how to design rubrics. Rubrics are the tools that we use to evaluate and give feedback on the writing. And we're going to discuss how to give good and effective feedback to our students. So, this is just a, an opening question. Which do you believe is more effective? Should students write many assignments throughout a course? And when we say many assignments, we mean many assignments of one draft. Or should they write fewer assignments but revise those assignments several times? Where do students learn the most? Do they learn by writing, just writing, or do they learn by revising? Is the intent behind this question. seems to be clear and I agree with you students write fewer assignments with several drafts of each one not all writing is equal not all writing helps students learn and we're going to talk about that when we talk about drafting how students learn in the process of correcting their own errors in the process of revisiting and repeating their own ideas and by revising their own ideas. So when is the last time you used the writing process to create a piece of writing? Because 
I had so many misconceptions. Last year I had the opportunity to take a, a course in writing uh, for blogging. And that was a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. Now I appreciate the writing process. Right. But sometimes you see it's boring or tedious or... Mm -hmm. is that writing is more connected with academic writing, right? right? In terms of as a university assignment or something that demands a lot of detail, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I still do not see like writing as something that can be creative, pleasurable, very simple, right? Mm -hmm. Something very simple, not so structured, like free writing. Right. But, uh, I think uh, it has to do a lot with our culture. Um, we are, I don't think Costa Rica has a culture of writers yeah, as well as reading. And that's why at school we're not really taught to write for pleasure. Mm -hmm. We're more taught to write assignments and, and essays mm -hmm. and for work. Right. And that's why, again, this is very important, what you are going to show through the, through this w webinar, right? right? Because we will see other possibilities of, mm -hmm. or required assignments or things students can do, you know, to make it more pleasurable and enjoyable, right. and even for teachers right. as well. And there might be times in your life when you're using the writing process, but you don't think of it as using the writing process. So maybe you want to apply for a job or a program and you write your application, your essay, and you have a friend look, hey friend, can you read this for me? Well, that's kind of peer review right there. Mm -hmm. Or you say, I'm going to write this and then I'm going to put it away for a couple of days and look at it again. That is revising, right? So we may not think of everything we're doing as the writing process when in reality we are using it sometimes. So this is our assignment we're going to be working with today. So um, I would like everyone to take out, take out your pencil and your paper or your computers, um, whichever you prefer to write with. So we're going to ask you to think about an unforgettable day in your lives. So this could be something happened to you that was scary, meaningful, happy, mysterious, an unforgettable day. And we're going to give you a couple of minutes to brainstorm. Just make a list of two or three or five things about that day in your life that you found to be unforgettable. Okay, so just to clarify, we would like everyone who is participating to take out your piece of paper and pen or your computer, whichever you prefer, and to write about an unforgettable day in your life or think about an unforgettable day in your life. This is the brainstorming process. So this could be something that happened to you that was scary or meaningful or happy, joyful, mysterious, unforgettable. So it's a very broad topic. So we're going to give you a couple of minutes to brainstorm. You can make a list 
of three to five things about that day that are unforgettable, or maybe you can list three to five experiences and then you can narrow it down. So we're giving you opportunity to brainstorm and think about what you would like to share. And we would like them to tell us some of the regions. Right. right? So we will be asking for some brave people to share. So please don't choose an experience you don't feel like sharing that's maybe embarrassing or too personal. So we will be calling some of the regions, or, or some of you can volunteer, right, to, to share with all of us that brainstorming. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a one minute warning. We're going to take one more minute. So maybe it's people are putting a little heart because they're finished. That's kind of a nice signal to say, I'm done. Yeah. When you're finished, put a little heart for us. So we know that you're finished. Oh, now we're getting more. So it means more people are finished. That's a good signal, Mary. It's a great signal. Good job, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. I love Mentimeter. This is exciting. nice way to show that, okay, I'm ready, ready to move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. It will help us manage our time, actually. That's really great. Okay, I'm going to quickly go to the questions for a minute. Yeah. Let's see if I can uh, figure this out. Right, this is what I need. So I copy this. I need to copy that. Yeah, we're learning in front of you guys. Okay, we're gonna go back to this. this. Sorry, guys, I'm learning how to moderate your questions. <laughs> Come with this. Let's see. Okay. Sam, just let me know when you're ready. I think we're ready. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to ask our brave panelists, Shirley and Jonathan, just to kind of share their brainstorms. And then we're going to give you a couple of minutes to share with a friend or a partner. So we're going to be modeling what we're going to ask you to do. So I'm going to ask Jonathan, you want to share a list of things? Or? Um, yeah, um, so my unforgettable day in my life, uh, how many? But right. uh, one of those was the first time I was on a plane. Uh, that was uh, actually three, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And why uh, three things, three to five things about that day? Well, number one, I had never been to an airport. And so that was a totally new experience. Uh, the experience of seeing everything from the air. I remember being 
um, sitting there by the, the, the plane window and looking down and I was like just like a kid <laughs> so excited about seeing that and oh that's Cuba oh that's the, the ocean oh that's right nice. and um, also because I had heard so many things about being in an airport and it somehow made me a little scared about like take care of your bags and be careful with this and be careful with that and don't bring water and don't don't take this on your luggage and so those were the things that made it an unforgettable experience for me. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Shirley, do you want to share a little bit? Sure, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, mine is very similar. Uh, it was the first time too that I traveled, but the, the what what was more um, exciting for me was when I saw the snow falling. Oh, I your always, first time seeing snow. Yes, so I always dreamed about seeing the snow. And yeah. the first time I went and I saw the snow falling, I was like a little kid. Oh I was gosh. very, very, very happy. That's so interesting. <laughs> okay, great, great. So we would like for you to take this opportunity to share your brainstorm with a friend, the person next to you, or maybe a small group of three. Um, you know, this is what I think about writing, this is my story. Just share your ideas. We're going to give you about two or three minutes to do this. finished, please give us a little heart on Mentimeter so that we know your group is finished. Okay, we're going to take one more minute, so this is your one minute warning. Make sure everyone in your group has a chance to share.
What is the most important part of your story? stories. So you as teachers probably know this already, but your students may not. So it's important to think about the genre of every text we're going to be writing. So stories have a few things in common, good stories. They have a hook or some sort of sentence that pulls the audience in. Sometimes it's a question, sometimes it's a shocking statement, sometimes it's a statistic. Um, and they all have an exposition. That's the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, the how. When is your story happening? If we don't know some of this information, we're going to be confused by your story. And then your story will have a rising action. The things that are happening that build the tension within the story, which leads to the climax, which is the most important part of the story. The most exciting, scary, joyful, mysterious, whatever emotion you're trying to portray, that's the most of that emotion. And then the resolution, the <sighs> moment, the conclusion, the lesson, the reflection, what you carry with you as a result of your experience. Okay, so let's look at an example story. 
So I'm going to read this story to you. This is my story, actually. I wrote this um, for us, and this is a true story. And as I'm reading it to you, I would like for you to see if you can identify the hook, the exposition, the rising action, the climax, and the resolution. So this is called The Time I Was in a Plane Crash. So I thought it was interesting that all three of us were going to talk about airplanes today. <laughs> Would you believe me if I said I was in a plane crash? Well, when I was 18, I was in a plane crash. My father owns a small airplane. One time when we were coming home from a flight, he began to land the airplane. However, it was dark and he didn't have enough light to land the plane. So he lifted up the landing gear and wheels on the plane. We made a big circle around the airport and started to land again. All of a sudden, we collided with the ground. My father forgot to put the wheels down. We bounced off the ground and back into the air. I quickly pulled my seatbelt tight around my waist. Then we crashed into the ground again. It felt like a really bumpy roller coaster ride. Eventually, the plane stopped moving, and miraculously, we discovered that nobody was hurt, except for the airplane. I hope you believe me when I say it was an unforgettable day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you want them to work on identifying the hook? I suppose because the next slide is, is the actual Right. Result. So maybe with your friends, your group that you've been talking to, um, why don't you just think together out loud, share together what you think is the hook, what you think is the exposition, what you feel is the rising action, the climax, and the resolution. So Shirley Jonathan, what do you want to think? I think the hook is the oh. So I'm going to ask Shirley and Jonathan what they think is the Hulk exposition, rising action, climax, and resolution. I think the Hulk is the question you have there. Uh, would you believe me if I said I was in a plane crash? Mm -hmm. um, because that actually uh, tells me that actually tells me like, oh, I, uh, I mean, I get, I get, like, I want to know more about it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then when it says, well, when I was 18, I was in a plane crash, for me that would be the exposition because you start explaining how it happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the rising action, it's when, uh, let's see, when you start telling, uh, let's see. It was dark in the night, like you, you start know kind something's of not quite right. Exactly, exactly. Right. Then we tried to land, right. we went over mm -hmm. again. You know that something's not normal here. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the climax, I would say, starts 
okay, where it says all of a sudden we collided with the ground right. because it's starting to get more exciting. That's the that's the main idea. It's the plane crashed, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the resolution is when you said eventually the plane stopped moving and miraculously we discovered that nobody was hurt mm -hmm. except for the plane. Right. Uh, that's where you have like the end of the story. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that I love the words that you're using in the writing because um, it actually makes me feel as if I was there. Like I feel like I can I can picture the plane going, crashing in the ground, going up again, like that. I mean, probably what you usually see in movies, right? Like people getting scared, you uh, like tightening your seatbelt, yes. that's, yeah. Even for us as teachers, I think this is a great practice that we should actually do more often. Uh, we should, um, I don't know, write something, whatever we want, and show it to a, a co-worker or another teacher so he can give us some feedback and maybe we can improve. Yeah, and I, I think it's a good idea to share a model with your students because it helps them get to know you better, especially this kind of thing when it's going into personal writing about this is a true story that actually happened to me. I, it seems like it's unreal, but it is a real thing that happened, an experience in my life, and it made a big impact on me, which I could write more about that. But, yeah. Do you want to see Sam's, Sam's answers? Yes, this writing. is my answers to what I think are the hook, exposition, rising action, climax, and resolution. Perfect. <clears throat> So I um, surprisingly agree with Jonathan and <laughs> Shirley. <laughs> so the hook is that question, right? You want some sort of statement to kind of draw your audience in. Um, you don't want to just say, hey, let me tell you about the time I was in a plane crash. You don't want to give away everything. I like that, would you believe me? Most people have not had this experience, and it's, it's kind of an unbelievable experience that we survived. Um, and then this exposition is the part that Shirley was mentioning. How old was I? Where, who was in the plane with me? Who was driving the plane? What happened? We were flying around as like a normal trip. Um, and then, as Jonathan mentioned, you know something's not right. This is the rising action. We, we didn't have enough light to land the plane. Uh-oh. we got to make some adjustments here. You know something is coming because it's not the normal course of just let's just land the plane. And then that climax, that all of a sudden, boom, we collided with the ground. And this whole part, this is, I think, part of what's going on in the climax. We forgot to put the wheels down, we were bouncing around, and I'm pulling my seatbelt, and it's just chaos. And it felt like a really bumpy roller coaster. It's nice to have a metaphor if you can teach a simile or um, some sort of metaphor for your students. That might be for advanced students, maybe in your high school, surely. You could yeah, do something like that. Definitely. I will try that. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, this resolution, you know, what happened to us? Were we okay? Yes, we were okay. The plane was messed up, of course, um, but we were okay. And again, my conclusion kind of ties back to my hook. You know, I hope you believe me when I say it was an unforgettable day. I've got that believe me part in the beginning and the end to kind of draw that conclusion to a close, tie it up with the little bone, so to speak. Um, I, I was just thinking that some people might be wondering right now, and what if I work in elementary school? How can I do this with my students? Because this is very advanced language. Right. But I can think of stories like the Three Little Pigs and the Wolf, or Little Red Riding Hood. You teach in elementary school. Yes, I teach in elementary school. Um, and so I, I'm thinking about what stories can be suitable. And so if we examine Little Red Riding Hood, it's a story my students know from their first language. It won't be difficult for them to understand the story if I use pictures. And then I can tell them, okay, what is the beginning? Right. Uh, when is the climax? What do you think is the most important part of the story? And so we can go examining right. all the parts. So I think a good way would be uh, with the students in the classroom would be giving them this type of example first so they can picture it and have the idea where every part goes. And then we can start getting them to write. Right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Something I wanted to maybe you to elaborate a little bit. It's in the term genre. 
Genre. Genre. Genre. Because genre. You, you refer to that as something that they have to pay attention sure. to. Sure. And I'm not, I'm not so sure they understand Sure. That. So genre for any piece of writing is what makes that piece of writing unique. Is it an email? Is it an essay? Is it a story? Is it um, a myth? These are different types of writing. Genre, just a fancy way of saying a different type of writing, I guess. Different kinds of writing. You don't write an email the same way you write your CV. You don't write your CV the same way you write a letter to the newspaper. Or a grocery list. Or a grocery list. Or a blog. Or a WhatsApp right? message. Or a WhatsApp message. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want any of my students to read my WhatsApp messages because they would be horrified by my grammar and slang and lack of punctuation and spelling and all these things because it's a different genre. Yes. Right? And, and I think it's important we think about a genre. Again, going back to my school where I teach, I would probably use the genre of uh, non-fiction short stories with, that, with my students because that's what they like mm -hmm. to imagine, to think about, I don't know, the wolf, the monster, the, the person in space that um, had some problems and explore their creativity because sure. they're very creative. I don't think I will ask them to write an email or to no. write a CV or no. to write a formal letter, right? Um, no, because so that's not appropriate for them and exactly. it's not meaningful for them, right? Mm -hmm. It's not time yet. Or mm -hmm. even a birthday note. Oh, of course, or, yeah. Or, or a post-it or a list. Or a list. Mm -hmm. Something that we know will, um, you know, get their attention oh. and they will start being interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something that they something will have to do. Something they like, something related to their usual life. Mm -hmm. Like writing a letter to a friend, sure. or writing a um, brochure mm -hmm. with travel information. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at if you are going to assign something like this in your classes, um, you would write a prompt. We're going to call this a task, right? The assignment for your students. So this is the assignment that I could give to my students. Write a short story, a paragraph. I want them to know it's not a novel, it's just a brief writing. Describing an unforgettable day in your, your life. Remember, good stories include a hook, an exposition, who, what, where, when, why, etc. A rising action, a climax, and a conclusion. We will brainstorm in class and share our stories with each other. Here is the timeline. So I think it's important to notice that in my task, I am telling students what they're going to be doing, writing a story, how long it's supposed to be, a paragraph. I prefer not to tell them how many words to write because the students just end up counting the words. I tell them generally speaking a paragraph, a page, three paragraphs, something like that. Also I don't want to count words, I think that's a waste of my time as a teacher. So I don't give a word count, that's my preference. And then I tell them this is what you need to include in your story. It must have hook, exposition, rising action, climax, conclusion. And I'm assuming that we've already talked about this a little bit in class. And I'm going to let them know that we will brainstorm in class and we're going to share our stories with each other. So don't write something that you don't want to share with other people at this time. And then I want to give my students a timeline of what we're going to be doing. When is it going to be due? We're going to do the brainstorm this day, and the next time we meet, we'll do the first draft, and the next time the revision, and the next time the final draft. So they have an idea in their heads how this assignment is going to be organized. Okay. So when I show my students the prompt, I also like to show them, if I can, the rubric for the first draft. I think it's really important for students to know how they are going to be evaluated. Even children have the right to know how they are going to be evaluated. Sometimes students get very upset because they think the teacher just makes up as they go along the criteria for a success on an assignment. But if you show them, okay, right away I know you're going to get three points for having a hook. If you forget the hook, I can't give you three points. If you have a hook that's not very good, I can give you one or two points. If you have an amazing hook, you can get three points. Um, right away, I need to know that you're going to get three points for having an exposition. If you don't have one, I can't give you any points for it. 
If you have a great one, I can give you three. If you have an okay one, I can give you one or two points. Um, and then the rising action. Again, if you don't have any rising action, I can't give you any points for it. And the climax must be the most important part. It must be clear to us. And then the reflection. You have to have some sort of conclusion. If there's no conclusion, then I can't give you points for it. And what I ask my students to do is, as they are writing, to keep the rubric and the prompt next to them, to guide them. Sometimes students get stuck. They have writer's block. They don't know what to write next. And if that happens, you can say, well, look at your rubric. What needs to come next? Have you written your hook? OK, great. Well, what needs to come next? Well, tell me some information. The who, the what, the where, the when, the why. So it's a guide for your students to writing. Writing is not a mysterious process. It actually is pretty simple and easy once we break it down for them and clarify it for them. The last part of my rubric is the comments. I call them glows and grows, but here I wrote strengths and ways to improve. I want to give my students positive feedback. These are the things you did well. Uh, you have a great hook. Your climax is very clear. However, your conclusion, this is your ways to improve, could you add more information to your conclusion? Or could you add more information to your rising action? There's some things I would like for you to discuss more. So I'm giving them what they did well and what I would like for them to work on for the next draft. Mm -hmm. And it's important to notice here, you lovely grammarians, there's nothing on here that talks about grammar. I want my students to have good ideas first before I focus on their grammar. If I give them a lot of comments on their grammar right now, when they change and revise their story, they're going to make different grammar mistakes. So then I've wasted my time commenting on the grammar, and they've wasted their time trying to fix it. So you would recommend grammar on the second draft? Right, right. So after they've revised. Once they have their content solid, once they have solid content, then I think it's appropriate to focus on grammar. Unless there is something that is just simply incomprehensible to you, then you can either make a suggestion, do you mean this? Or you can ask the student, hey, I don't understand this sentence. Can you rewrite the sentence or explain to me in person what you're trying to say? Sounds good. But I don't want the first draft to have a lot of grammar comments on it because that's going to prevent the students from wanting to keep revising. They're going to already feel upset about all their mistakes. Oh, okay. Good idea. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I want to take a moment for you all to what did you notice about the task prompt and the rubric? This is the microphone. Oh, so these are people if they have questions at the microphone or just observations they'd like to make. You can give them to the person in charge, and they can give them to us in your room. Yeah. Shirley and Jonathan, do you want to make any comments about the task in the rubric? Um, I, I think the task is very, very clear for students. Like, um, when you see, you can really see what the teacher is expecting from you. And also in the rubric, if I follow the rubric and I, I start showing my students how to follow the rubric, it's, we have to train them as well. Yes. Yes. And so when I, uh, when the student is writing, they can check and say, oh yes, I'm going to get these three points because I have the hook, because I have the, uh, like the uh, exposition, I have the climax, I have everything that the teacher is asking for. And that way also, we're going to avoid students saying, because sometimes they feel, oh, teacher, you gave 100 to this person because he's your favorite student. Yes. And that happens a lot with children. Yes. Children <laughs> used to tell you that. And so it's equal for everybody. You're making it as objective as possible. That is the idea. It makes your life as a teacher easier if you have clear tasks and rubrics and as objective as possible. It's not necessarily a checklist, but it is um, something that will help them guide them and it guides you. And I think it's really good the part where it says comments. Yes. That doesn't necessarily has to be uh, have to be a, a bad comment and negative. No, of course not. Sometimes when I'm um, 
you know, grading them in an oral test, they they become afraid because I'm taking notes, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Right, right. And I think the important idea here is transparency. Even children have the right to know what you expect of them and how you're going to assess them. And if they get used to this expectation, that will really help them a lot when they become bosses, when they become leaders, when they become people who are out and responsible citizens in the world. Um, I want to echo one of the comments that I saw there on the screen that says that the, um, the rubric is simple to create because we sometimes, like we teachers tend to complicate ourselves a lot. Mm -hmm. And we make these rubrics that in the end we don't even understand how we relate. <laughs> yes. And so doing something simple and for also the person that might have a question there about how this meets the MEPS requirements in terms of evaluation, we are going to see some examples that Shirley and I created later. So uh, it's possible to adapt kind of the same rubric to creating the criteria that MEP is requiring us to do for trabajo cotidiano and for yes. homework assignments and everything. So you're going to see that. So do you want to take a break? Um, well, I have to answer questions. Okay, all right, Mary's gonna take some time to answer some questions, excellent. Yeah, okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do, uh, I wanna share with you guys that I'm learning something new about Mentimeter here in real time. What I, on this particular Mentimeter, I opened a space for you to ask questions at any point throughout this webinar but I didn't know how to find them and work with them, and I figured that out, and I think what I want to do is show you some of the questions, um, and we're gonna quickly run through them, and I want, there's a couple that I really want to give some answers to. Some of them we won't answer right now, but we're gonna go through. Um, uh, so we're not, let's see, how do I find my, wait, wait, one second, I have to find my moderator. See my email. Um, thanks for today. No, it's not that one actually. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was ready. Oh my goodness. Oh wait, no, I can't get into that on this computer. Uh, hold on. Sent. No, that's not it. It's in the sent folder. sent in that I've approved. Some people got a little confused and put answers in their questions, uh, their answers in the question place instead of the question box for that. Uh, so some of them I didn't approve because of that. The first one I want to work with is, uh, are we getting information presented in the webinar for further use? And I want to just show you the links now to, I don't know if it's going to be in my inbox, links for today. You can see here, the link is bit.ly backslash 2018 capital MEPSEM US Embassy webinar resources. So we will be giving that to you uh, later on in the presentation, but if when you go to this, you'll find the resources, you'll find the slides for the presentation, you'll find everything that you need for that particular question. Um, so we will come back to that, um, and just so you know, it's there. Um, so that was one question I wanted to mark as answered. Um, there's a question here, would you recommend to peer sharing the writings among the students to have feedback? What do you guys think about peer feedback? I would recommend having your students share their writings with each other and maybe the group can ask questions 
but I prefer not to grade students on their peer evaluations because I don't think it's fair for one student to give a grade to another student. And I but they can give feedback. Yes, I would have them ask questions they if they didn't understand something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what normally happens is they say, oh, that was great, and they don't really give a lot of great feedback. Um, so I prefer to have them share with each other in the early stages of writing and brainstorming, just like we did earlier today, and to have them, to give the student an opportunity to take those um, ideas or the beginnings of an idea to talk it out with another person to have help it develop into a fully fledged idea and they can share with that other person and if the other person has a question well who was in the, who was flying the airplane oh my dad let me write that in oh well who where were you going when you came back well let me write that in so the peer might have a lot of good suggestions for maybe clarifications or missing information. I don't prefer to grade students on this activity or I give them like a participation grade for it, but I don't want to grade them on grading each other because it's my job to give them the evaluation. Mm -hmm. And children especially, um, I don't know that they are capable of giving the best kinds of feedback to each other. So I think it's important to share to help the writer solidify their ideas. And I think it's important for the writer to get feedback from a peer on things that need to be clarified. I just don't have a rubric for that. I wouldn't grade them on that. I would give them time in class to do it though. I think for children, I would probably give them a little uh, sheet. Or maybe a checklist. One or two questions. Yes. Like, I don't know, um, is the story interesting? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Or maybe tell the parents, do you understand, like, the, do you story? understand the story? Do you have any other question about the story? Mm -hmm. So they can ask, as you said, like, oh, who was, who was uh, like, uh, piloting the plane? Right. Or were you with somebody else besides your dad? Right. So you can include that in your uh, draft. But I want to actually give them more than that because we don't, we don't also want them to do feedback that is negative. Right. We want them to give us positive feedback. What often happens, and maybe Shirley can address this as well, with my students who are more advanced, they try to correct each other, and then the writer doesn't believe the peer that they're giving good feedback, so then I, as the teacher, have to get in the middle of them and say who was right and who was wrong. So I feel like that's a little bit of a dangerous territory. So I feel I prefer not to have them evaluate each other. I don't know what's your experience with peer review in high school, but what you would recommend. Well. I would recommend to do it. It's not that dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I have tried it and it works. It works because they they notice some things that maybe the other student didn't. Mm -hmm. So it helps. It helps yeah. them. Yeah. I also think peer feedback is important to develop a sense of community in the classroom. Right. Exactly. And for students to get to know each other. And I think it's important for them also as getting other models and understanding how you know how other people are writing and expressing themselves. And I think that um, near peer feedback is often more powerful than teacher feedback mm -hmm. because it's safer. Mm -hmm. It's much safer to talk to a peer than to talk to a, a, a teacher. So um, and yeah, there's a lot of studies out there that talk about near peer work um, that really helps language learning. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to clarify that I'm not saying that you shouldn't use peer feedback. I'm just saying I wouldn't evaluate it or grade it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I feel like that puts um, an undue pressure on the peer and on the writer, and it puts the teacher in the middle of them. So there's one last comment I want to make, and then we're going to take a break. Unless, uh, is there something you want to add? No, no. I, I just wanted to add, in terms of peer feedback, that uh, besides this sense of community, collaboration, which is a uh, one of the, of the soft skills that we are promoting in this new English curriculum, we also are developing um, and enhancing the learning. Because when you are able to explain, to provide feedback to someone, you are also reinforcing, you are also assessing your own learning, what you know. So I think it creates or enhance or gives more, more opportunities for learners to revise what they know, mm -hmm. to see how can they articulate that, sure, mm -hmm. that they know through 
the feedback they are providing to the, the, the peer. Mm -hmm. So I think more learning happens. Mm -hmm. So we are enhancing the, the learning of, 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 the, of, the, of the students mm -hmm. when we give them those opportunities. Okay. So there's one question here that I want to address that is, um, hello camera, <laughs> hello camera. <laughs> there's one question I want to address that is not about the writing, but it's about the setup here. Um, uh, somebody mentioned that they were disappointed that their advisor wasn't with them today. Mm -hmm. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, we do understand that it's nice to have our advisors with us. Also, they have so much work to do. It's so much work to do. They can't all be with us today. So I understand your disappointment, um, and I know that um, I know that for whatever you know, whatever reason, your particular advisor had other work that they had to be doing today and couldn't be here. Um, all of our materials are available. All of the um, slides and the video will be available to share. And if there's something that you really want to communicate to your advisor, please do. Please let them know. Um, and and I, I want to add something. Mary, with regards to that, um, well, uh, I, I don't know how it happened, but it seems that the regional English advisors were not really officially called to participate. And uh, we acknowledged, as you are saying it, that that is very important, and we made sure that this doesn't happen anymore. So that in the future, you uh, will be uh, called with your a regional English advisor as it should. So uh, don't worry, it will be improved in the in the next uh, in the next activities that we will organize. Okay, so we are we are going to take a 15 minute break and uh, we'll be back. When we come back we're gonna look a little bit more at criteria for rubrics and look at writing second drafts. Well they have to write their first draft. Oh, look at writing first drafts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm ahead. <laughs> Have a nice break. We'll see you in 15. Yes. We'll see you in 15. Hello, everyone. How was Rizzes? We are ready to come back. Ready to resume? Okay. Welcome back, everyone. We are glad that you survived the break and made it back. Um, so we're going to do a slight review of what we've been talking about the first hour, and then we're going to start writing. So Mary, can we? <clears throat> So this is a little review of prompts and rubrics, the relationship between the prompt and the rubric, especially for the first draft. We're going to talk about rubrics for the second and third draft. So they should be a mirror to each other, meaning that the information in the prompt should also be in the rubric. And ideally, you should show them to students at the same time, if you can. So before the student starts writing, they can see this is my assignment and this is how I'm going to be graded. Students have the right to know and understand how they're going to be graded. That will take away those, oh, my teacher likes Jonathan better than me and Shirley is the best student so she always gets the best grade. So we want to not have that situation in our class because it creates uh, chaos and discord. And it also makes your life easier as the teacher if the rubric has clear criteria because it is less subjective. It will make it easier for you to grade. Okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to give you 10 minutes to write the first draft of your paragraph about a memorable day. Please remember this is just a draft. We are not going to grade you. It doesn't need to be perfect. And we are going to be revising it and sharing this with peers to get feedback. So as you're writing, we're going to show you the rubric so you know what to remember to write. So this is a guide for you as you are writing. If you write a couple of lines and you forget what you need to write next, you can look back at the rubric and that will help you know what you need to write next. 
Okay, so we're going to set a time for 10 minutes. I will tell you a warning when you have two minutes left. Okay, more people coming in. Mm. So let's move a second and I'll tell you. Do you want me to go back to the other slide? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so for those of you who just came back from the break, welcome back. We are going to do writing now. So we're going to give you 10 minutes to write the first draft of your paragraph about a memorable day. Remember, this is just a draft. It doesn't need to be perfect. We're going to be revising it, and we're going to be sharing it with peers. You can write on your pen and paper, or you can write with your computer. And we're going to show you the rubric, so if you get stuck and you don't know what to write next, you can look at the rubric, and it will act as a guide for you in your writing process. I will give you a warning when we have two minutes left.
everyone, I want to let you know this is your two-minute warning. So you have two minutes left to finish your first drafts. Remember, don't worry about grammar. Just worry about getting your ideas down on the paper using the rubric as your guide. So the hook, the body, and the conclusion. Okay, everyone, that is your time, your 10 minutes to write your first draft. Again, please don't be um, concerned about your grammar at this point. We're just trying to get our ideas down on the paper. Mary, can we go to the next? No. So what we're going to do now is a little bit of peer review. So we're going to use the rubric to give feedback to a peer. So what we have done is we've taken the rubric and we've taken all the, the points out of it. And we're going to ask you to read your story out loud to a friend. And then the person who is listening can tell the writer about their experience of these things. What was your experience of the hook? Tell the writer what you see as the exposition. And if you have any questions, you should ask them. Maybe there's some information they forgot to write down. Tell the writer where you feel the tension rising. Tell the writer which sentence you feel is the climax. Um, and then tell your writer about your experience of the reflection, the conclusion, the final thought. Um, and this is really important to ask the writer any other questions you think might help him or her with the ideas of his or her draft. And we're going to not comment on the grammar this time except if it's incomprehensible. In that case you should say, can you rephrase that? I don't understand what you mean. Is there another way to say that? So we're going to take about maybe five or six minutes for you to share in a small group a little bit of peer feedback. Ver los otros lugares también. ¿Cómo se puede pasar? Oh. Um, hey, everybody. Um, I always want to check in. Uh, some I see some people interacting, but I also see some people not interacting. I see some people sitting by themselves. Um, so I'm a little concerned. If this is a task that's pair work, 
So if you see somebody without a partner and you need to make a group of three, you can quickly make a group of three. But we'd like to see you guys partner up and give each other feedback about your writing. Um, please. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> okay, everyone, welcome back. Hopefully you have had a little bit of time to share with one or two people about your story. Uh, we're just going to take a little bit of time to kind of model um, what we did in our group because there are a couple of things that came up in our group that I think are worth um, sharing with the entire group. And then after we're done, we're going to ask people from uh, the different regions to share, maybe one person from each region or a couple of regions if someone had, wants to volunteer to read their story for us, um, a brave person. Uh, so you can be thinking about if you want to be that person as we're sharing our peer review. So I'm going to ask Jonathan to read his, to Shirley and I, we're going to be his peer review group. All right. So um, as I said before, it's about uh, my first time on a plane. So people have always wanted to be able to uh, fly. Now I know why. My first time on a plane was at age 30, and this is definitely a day I do not want to forget. I remember packing my suitcase, calling the airline like 100 times to get information on do's and don'ts when traveling. 
Uh, once I got to the airport, I fell as a four-year-old boy entering his favorite toy store. The, to that moment, six strangers that were to fly with me were there. I remember that after security and some waiting, I was able to get into the plane. I felt like the man stepping on the moon for the first time. The takeoff was not as scary as people had told me. My whole trip, I was stick to the plane window, and I really think everyone should have this experience at least once in their life. Excellent. So, a couple of things I want to point out about your writing is the use of metaphor. You can use this opportunity to teach metaphor with your students. You said, I felt like I was the first man stepping onto the moon when I got into the plane. Um, and I loved your rising action. We were talking about calling the airport a hundred times to check and make sure you're bringing all the right things and going through security and how you felt going through security. So this assignment is a really good opportunity to teach students about metaphor. It's also a good way to teach them about feelings, if that's the vocabulary you want to go with. Um, and you can also teach them about the senses. You know, how does it feel? How does it see? How do you see it? Um, how does it, what is the touch sensation, the smell, all of these things which really bring our stories to life. Okay, Shirley's going to read her story for us, which is also uh, related to traveling. Okay, so mine, have you ever experienced, no, have you ever seen snow falling? Mm. Many years ago, I had these beautiful moments in my life since I always dreamed of it since I was a child. This time was my first trip outside of Costa Rica. I went to the United States. It was early in the morning and I woke up. I looked through the window and I saw the snow falling and I was so excited, I could not believe what my eyes were seeing. So I obviously opened the, the room door and went outside because I wanted to touch the snow and feel the uh, snow falling over me. I cannot explain the happiness I was feeling in that moment. I felt so lucky because that was actually the last time it snowed that season. So I got the luck to experience to experience it only for once. And I still remember that as if it was yesterday. Excellent. So one thing I noticed when Shirley was reading her story is she read her first line and then she changed her mind. I don't know, Shirley, if you can go back to that and tell me what happened there. <laughs> okay, I don't know. I, I wrote it and at, at the time I wrote it, didn't see that it didn't sound right. Mm -hmm. So when I started writing it, uh, saying it out loud, then I noticed that this was not sounding correctly. Right. So I, I put, have you ever experienced uh, experience of snow falling? You know, no, that doesn't sound right. Have you ever seen snow falling right. sound better? So I think this is a really good example to illustrate how important it is to read our work out loud because often our ears are more advanced than our hands when we are writing. So you can hear that something sounds weird or it feels weird when you read it out loud that you won't be able to tell that if you're reading it silently. So I think that is another example of how important it is for students to share their work and especially for us to read our work out loud. Any examples? Somebody want to from us? Yes, now we want to hear from you. Who would like to share? wants to participate. Okay, Peninsular. Peninsular. Peninsular? Oh, Peninsular. oh yes. Ready? Yes. yes. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Good morning, everyone. I want to share my I want to share my writing. This is the first day of classes. Can you believe me if I said that the first day of classes was a day of different feelings? I went to the school in San Joaquin de Flores, located in Heredia, when I was six years old, because I wanted to study. When I came to the English classroom, I didn't want to sit there because I got nervous, because I was weird and I didn't know my classmates. When we introduced ourselves, I started to feel happy because I met new people. At the break, I went to play with them and my day was unforgettable. I learned that I don't have to get scared every day. It is a new day to start again 
enjoy the life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. It's such a brave, a brave thing you did. <laughs> so I really appreciated, especially the conclusion and resolution of your story. You were telling what you learned. I learned that I don't have to be scared every day. I learned to enjoy life. I think that's a really important part of sharing a story, is telling what I learned from the story. So I think you're strong, a strong part of your story is that conclusion and that resolution. And I related to that because I remember my first day of school, and I'm sure you all do too, Definitely. the feelings of being nervous and scared and meeting new people. It's something that is universal, and I think a lot of people can relate to that. Any other regions? Any, any other people want to share in any other regions? We'd love to hear your stories. It'd be nice if we could have maybe just one more brave person. You can do it. <laughs> Scarlett from San Jose. Okay, Scarlett. Hey, okay, I hear you. I'm okay, I'm sorry. I I think there's another mic open, and I wasn't sure if it was me or not. Can we hear? Can we hear? Can we hear uh, Scarlett from San Jose Oeste? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna read what I just wrote um, for this activity. Yeah. It says, have you ever pushed yourself to the limit? Have you ever been so tired that you feel that you cannot continue? Have both things happened to you in a foreign country? Yes, yes, and yes. Those would be my answers to these questions. Three years ago, I embarked myself into a solo travel adventure, and I ended up in Sri Lanka, 17,401 kilometers away from my home country, Costa Rica. In Sri Lanka, there is a sacred mountain called Adam's Peak, which is known as one of the most amazing places to visit in the country. I'm an adventurous person, and I decided to do it. I decided that it would be nice to visit the place, but there, is a, there was a small detail to consider. Well, to get to the peak of the mountain, the only way is to go up an approximately 6,000 steps. I started my hiking at 1 a.m. in the morning. It was all dark and I could not find the entrance, so I got lost. I walked to nowhere for about an hour. After the hour, a nice local man who had seen me going around helped me to arrive to the entrance and I could start the real hiking. I spent three hours going up 6,000 steps. While I was going up, I was hungry, angry, depressed, stressed, I was in pain and I felt dumb for getting into this, but anyway, <laughs> I decided to finish. When I reached the top of the mountain, it was cold and I was sweaty and tired, but I was able to see one of the most amazing sunrises, that, sunrises I've ever seen. With this experience, I learned about my own mind strength and the ability of my body to do amazing things if I trust it. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Yeah. loved how clear the process of the rising action was in your story, the walking up all of the 6,000 steps, and you're describing all of your emotions. I was angry and depressed and sad and happy, and you get to that peak and you see the most beautiful sunrise. Um, it was a very cathartic story, I felt like, and I, I think it was a huge accomplishment. So the, the points were very clear. Um, let's hear from Kanyas. Okay. Yes. Hi. 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 What's Hello. your name? Kevin. Kevin Villegas. Cañas. So Cañas. This, yes. Okay. So this is my story. Surfing in a Hawaiian hidden beach. Long time ago, while I was surfing in a beautiful morning on the coast of Big Island, Hawaii, me and my friend Joao saw a fin 
of some kind of sea animal and immediately we yelled shark since it looked like a fin of a shark. We instantly start heading towards the shore and then hurry to catch the first wave. At that moment, I felt like I was a champion of surfing. When I was surfing down, I saw a Hawaiian man went to see what was the fin that we saw. And it was a, string, a stingray swimming close to the shore. It was too late already because I was on the shore, but we were already safe. That's it. I love that rising action where you're saying, we thought it was a shark fin, so we're swimming to get away from it. And your simile, I felt like I was the champion. That kind of language is the kind of language that really makes your stories come alive. So, yeah, I definitely recommend that if you can use that kind of language with your students and model that and encourage them to use descriptive and metaphoric language if possible, that's amazing. Thank you. Okay, Guapiles, do we have someone from Guapiles who wants to share? No, from Punta Arenas. Andrea, and I want to share with you a simple story for daily life. Every single uh, woman has faced this when they become mothers. The story is this. How does a woman feel when she becomes being a mother for the first time? I remember me 20 years ago when I received the notice to be mother for me, the first time was a little nervous, but family and I received it so well, this, the news. We're happy, excited, wonder, but at the same time, I felt different in that moment. Everything was in mind, thinking about that boy or girl who's growing up in my tummy. How to be a mother, that was my question every day. So it was, the big challenge for me in my entire life. Not at all, it's easy when you are a mother, but since that moment, I've been facing the most difficult and also the most beautiful, responsible thing. Being responsible and a strong person with my kids, and I and my family too. Facing motherhood for me, has been one of the most important lessons, experiences in life. And I thought this was the much smart, it's the most important part for a woman facing life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I'm really sorry to say that there are more people who want to share, but we need to move on so we get through our other drafts. But I have notice of who is going to share, and hopefully I will have time to call on you later because your stories are beautiful and wonderful, and I want to hear them. But I want to make sure that we use our time wisely and proceed with our other drafts. The first drafts are amazing, so I'm interested to see how the second drafts and final drafts turn out. So I have all the lists, so don't I'm not forgetting. So let's move on, Mary, really quickly. Okay. Okay, so at this point you have written the first draft and let's pretend you're, you have gotten feedback on it from your teacher. So this is the point where you're going to revise for your second draft. And I want to um, notice a couple of things about the second draft, the student's revision. So I have a couple of points for the student incorporated the feedback on content by adding extra information, deleting unnecessary information, and clarifying parts of the story that were confusing. So I want to make sure the student has good content. And then I 
notice specific errors in the writing. And I just wrote a lot of things here, like verb tense, verb form, punctuation, word choice. But if you are teaching children, maybe you only want to focus on the two or three grammar things that you are teaching in your class. Maybe you haven't talked about um, verb forms yet, or maybe you haven't talked very much about punctuation. So maybe you don't want to focus so much on that. Maybe you really want to focus on verb tenses. Maybe that's the grammar that you want to focus on. So try. I try not to overwhelm people with grammar um, in this this area. And you can see I'm not giving a grade for the grammar, I'm just noticing what are the grammar errors. And on their paper, I will probably mark where the errors occur using minimal marking symbols, which is my preference. And then again, I give strengths and ways to improve. And in the ways to improve, I might say, oh, Jose, please um, watch all of your verb tenses. This is a story, so your tenses need to be past tense because we're talking about something that happened in the past. So what did you notice about the rubric for the second draft? How is it similar or different to the rubric from the sure. first draft? Sure, yeah. What did you notice about in comparison with the other rubric? Um,
Okay, everyone, so we're coming to the end of our revising time. I do apologize if you didn't feel like you had enough time to revise. Obviously, if this were a class, we would have more time. But I do want to hear some examples from, we're going to start with Guapiles, and then Teraba, and then Upala. So those three regions are going to be able to present this time. And then for the third draft, we're going to hear from Descamparados, and Los Santos, and Santa Cruz. Okay, so first we're going to hear from Guapiles, and then Teraba, and then Upala. I need to change to the video. Video. Okay, so who who is going to read from Guapiles today? Two people. Okay, great. <coughs> okay, so I'm um, sorry. It's uh, it's called and. Uh, Unicorn for Christmas. <laughs> what what to do when your four year old daughter asks you for a unicorn for Christmas? How come I going to answer that question? Oh my god, the only thing I can think of is on the disappointment she's gonna feel if I tell her the truth. Unicorns don't exist. Oh no, I a terrible person and a terrible mom. I'm screaming inside. Her eyes are so sweet and innocent. She totally believes in unicorns and Santa Cruz as well. She even said, I want a unicorn, but no, any unicorn. A unicorn has to have a magic horn. You will whatever I want, mommy. What should I do? I ask myself, should I tell that unicorns don't exist? Or even worse, Santa doesn't exist either. That when I had this amazing idea to say that Santa Claus doesn't bring animals. But as soon as I say that, she replied, that's not true, Mom. Santa gave us a rabbit last year. Oh no, she's too smart. <laughs> Um, oh no, things are getting complicated right here. So I came up with my second good idea. We don't have room for this unicorn. My good idea was soon frustrated as well. She, when she said, yes, mommy, we have a big patio. And that's true. So then I come up with my great third idea. I don't have any, we don't have anything for feeding this unicorn. So then as when my Five-year-old boy said with his boy, boys, mommy, everybody knows unicorns only need a rainbow. Oh. That's the only thing they need. They, they run on it and they also feed on it. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so um, finally, I said um, that they're the last idea I have, and I say, oh no, guys, we have a Rottweiler, remember, little bear? And I think little bear will attack it. So finally, they realize that they don't have, they, they don't want the, the unicorn to get hurt. So she said, yes, mommy, you are right. I would rather not having a unicorn than, than getting hurt by the dog. So that day, they kept their innocence and fantasy and I was a good mommy. Yay, that's awesome. I love your resolution. They kept their innocence and their fantasy and I still got to be a good mom. Win-win for everybody. Okay, you said there were two people from Guapiles who want to share? Hello? 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 Well, I, I like that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine. Imagine that in the middle of the forest, you will find your favorite singer or band. Well, that is something that similar that happened to me and I will remember for the rest of my life. It was four years ago that I attended to a rock festival in a very beautiful place called La Lucha in Desamparados with my husband, sister, and her husband. It was a 
three-day festival with different bands around the world. I remember that there one of the bands were uh, performing, and, and it was my favorite band. Uh, so there will be also a chance to greet and meet the band. I was so excited to have that chance, so I got the tickets for uh, that greet and meet. And when I finally was my turn to say hello to the band, I couldn't say a word. I was shocked. <laughs> Hopefully, the members of the band told me to breathe and relax. And I finally felt so happy that they were very nice to me and that I had the opportunity to share with the band I, I admire. Lovely. I love how the band is helping you feel called. I think that was my favorite part of that story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, Teraba. Teraba. Thank you. Accent, pronunciation. Teraba. <laughs> Someone from Teraba want to share? Red dress, Teraba. No? I don't actually see Tedema on the starting of you. No. Next. Okay. Uh Tereba will keep you in mind. Upala, is someone from Upala willing to share? Hello? Hi, hi from Upala, Dirección okay, Regional okay. Zona Norte Norte. All right, let's hear your story. Uh, the time I had a motorcycle accident. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I like riding my motorcycle. However, I will never forget the time I have got a motorcycle accident. I remember it was five before seven in the morning. I was driving to my work and there was a car in front of me. Suddenly it turned to left without putting the light, saying it was going to park outside the road. I had to stop abruptly and though I did not crush the car, I lost control and fell down from my vehicle. I did not break a leg, but I've got a hole in my knee wow, that really hurt. It was, I was taken to the hospital, and already there I was healed and sent home to rest by two months. I will never forget that day. It was really shocking, so be aware on the road when driving any vehicle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for sharing. I love your, again, your conclusion. Be aware, this is what I learned. Those stories are very valuable to share. And if you can share them with your students, who probably will ride motorcycles one day, I think that would be really valuable. Okay, so we're gonna move on and go back to our presentation now. Oh, no. Switch to... Uh, Okay, so um, we just want to take a moment to see what kind of comments or observations and questions you have about brainstorming, writing your first draft, and writing your second draft. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> So someone said the second draft is a little longer. This is usually true because you will think of more things you want to add, and I think that is fine. I do not have a problem with my students adding more. Usually I have the opposite problem. I, it's hard for me to get my students to write a lot. So if your second draft is longer, I say congratulations to you if you added more details. You probably improved your story. Okay, let's move on real quick, Mary, thanks. 
So what do we mean when we say process writing? You should have hopefully a clear idea right now. Or hopefully you do. Hopefully you understand the process as we've been doing it. steps. Then when we when we talk about writing, we don't have to do that in just one class. Like no, we can do I know. Can't. One draft today mm -hmm. and yeah. then next, next week. Next week, the revi mm -hmm. revision, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the final draft would be the third one? Usually. For me, I mean, it might be the fourth or the fifth or whatever. And yeah. Okay, so I feel like everyone gets the ideas and it's the steps to follow. So, oh, can we go back one more? Yeah, it's time. So this was my answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Oh man, hello, wait, okay. Here we go. So when we teach process writing, we are teaching our students that writing is a process. There are several steps to creating a good piece of writing because rarely do we ever do our best writing on the first draft. Our thinking gets more complex and nuanced as we think about the topic and revise our text. We sound smarter on the third draft than we do on the first draft. Which is the reason it got longer for some people, right? Right, right. Because some people get shorter. And this is the most important part, is we learn through the process of revision. Students learn when they correct and revise their own writing. Okay. So what are some of the steps? We've already gone through some of them, but brainstorming, outlining, organizing, hook. I think hook, exposition, and conclusion are parts of the piece, piece that we're right. writing. Mm -hmm. They're not really parts of the process. Right. Um, it's important to, to not mix up the what and the how. Right. So right now we're thinking about the how. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go to the, the next answer. slide. Mm -hmm. So these are the common steps in process writing. You may or may not have time to do all of these with your students, but these are things that are common in the process writing world. So pre-writing or brainstorming, which we did, taking notes, you could do a pro and con, depending on what type of uh, writing you're gonna be doing. You could do a mind map. There are so many different ways to brainstorm. You could just talk to a friend. Uh, drafting, that's writing the first draft, getting feedback from the teacher on the content, and then you take the teacher's feedback and you revise to improve the content, and then the teacher will give you comments on your grammar, and then we edit, which means you take the teacher's feedback on the grammar and use that to edit your grammar, perfect it. Sometimes we'll have time for peer review. You may not always have time for peer review, although we think it is important. It could go anywhere in this process, in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. And then the last level is polishing and perfecting, making this something that you will want to publish or share. Um, I'm briefly going to share, when I teach writing, this is a mind map that I use when I teach the writing process, or process writing. Um, and uh, it show, it's a mind map that shows different steps. I, I see four different steps and different stages in each step. And I use it a lot to show that we don't always do all of the steps and we need to know where we are in this process and which direction we're moving in. Um, so if, if you like to think in mind map ways, it's a nice way to show that it's not linear. Um, yeah. So, okay. Okay, so this is important to note. An assignment might have three or more complete drafts before the final grade. This is what Shirley and I were just talking about. Each draft can be graded and weighted to make it clear that the process is important. We give points for the first draft, points for the second draft, to show our students that the time they're taking to perfect their ideas is important. We don't only give a grade to the final draft, because that's showing them the only thing we care about is the final draft. 
We care about the process um, and not just the product. So let's talk about good writing. What is good writing, quote unquote, good writing? How do you know if it's a good writing, good piece of writing? Because I like it. Well, like for the writer, a good piece of writing is you are saying what you wanted to say. Communication is the first one that someone said. Few errors. Calls the reader's attention. Good ideas, good grammar. I think that idea of communication is really important. Yeah, being able to transmit uh, what I meant right. to my audience mm -hmm. because they're not there to see my body language, right. my intonation. Right. What do you think, Shirley? Your thoughts on what is a good piece of writing? What makes it something good? Would you agree with what everybody's been saying? Well, the idea is that you understand the message. Mm -hmm. It's very important. And that it's clear. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be very, very, I don't know, very, um, what's the word? Interesting. <laughs> Maybe just something so simple. Clarity. Yeah. Well, not every not every piece of writing is interesting. A text message I yes. sent to my husband about my son is not going to be very interesting, but it needs to be clear. Exactly. That's it. So clarity is very important. I think and, so. And I think that it achieves its purpose. Yes. So I think that if you are talking about different pieces of writing, mm -hmm. I think that each uh, should. Uh, achieve that purpose, mm -hmm. right? If you are writing a note, then that note must be clear and must achieve follow some purpose. of those. Yeah, yeah, achieve its purpose. Okay, Mary, can I go? So my take on what is quote unquote good writing is it depends on the genre. It depends on the purpose, like Anna, Anna was saying. So um, a letter has to have the parts of a letter. A story has to have the parts of a story. A description has to have the parts of a description. And it's also important to note that in writing in English, the onus or the responsibility is on the writer to make their message clear to the reader. And this goes back to what some of you were saying about communication. It's my job as the writer. If you don't understand me as the reader, it's not because you're not a smart reader. It's because I failed as the writer. And that is cultural. That is not present in every culture, but it is present in English writing. Okay. Okay, we're going to go pretty quickly. So, if you're going to have your high school students write an email asking the teacher about missing a class, this is something that could happen, right? I missed a class, I need to talk to my teacher, how do I write this email? What are the parts of the email you need to teach them? Let's go on. Yeah, answers. we're just gonna go to the answer. So, any email has a greeting, has an introduction, I hope you're doing well, hasn't the weather been lovely, etc., etc. The purpose, I'm writing to ask you what we did in class today. The development, the reason I need this from you, because I was sick and I'm really sorry. You're my favorite teacher, and I really don't want to miss anything. And then a conclusion, thank you for your help, and then sincerely or respectfully with your name. So when we teach a le an email, we're actually teaching students to do like five different things, all of these parts. So here's the task that we have in the curriculum for a primary school. It says, if you, um, this is the assignment, I don't, you can see it's for third grade. Welcome to Costa Rica Unit 6, and the learner is supposed to write a short description. And here's the example. Hello, I'm Maribel, I'm nine years old, I'm in third grade. I'm from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a beautiful place to visit. It has beautiful volcanoes, beaches, and mountains. There are colorful birds and flowers. There are wild animals in the national parks. For example, monkeys, anteaters, jaguars, and crocodiles. People are friendly. So this seems like a very simple text, but
But if we analyze it, we will notice the students are doing a lot of things. So this little task that we read requires you to greet the audience. Hello, my name is Maribel. You have to introduce yourselves. I am blah, blah, blah. You have to say where you're from. I'm from Costa Rica or from Alajuela or wherever you are from. And then they talked about the nature, the people, the animals, and the attractions. Four different things in this little description. And then I would just add a conclusion. Why should I visit your place? I'm a big fan of conclusions because it makes things feel finished. So that little example that we have from the curriculum is actually a very complicated text. And that students need to know what they are doing when they sit down to write. Okay. Let's go on to Jonathan's example. Right. So you can't see this very well. We're going to show it to you in parts. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to show you the full sheet so you can see how it's um, all together. And then Jonathan's going to talk through this assignment that he has for elementary school. Okay, so I was basically looking for uh, uh, the third grade curriculum. It's the same so, assignment, right? Yeah, the same assignment, but it's for third grade, what we're going to be doing next year with the new curriculum. And in the Unit 6, Welcome to Costa Rica, the goal that is in the, um, in the curriculum says learners can write simple descriptions of everyday objects, for example, a brief description of the country and its touristic attractions. So what will be the task? Um, I'm telling the students, use the example studied in class and the vocabulary learned to write a short descriptive paragraph about Costa Rica. Make sure to write a good topic sentence, good examples, a nice conclusion. This paragraph must have at least five lines. So um, I know Sam, before she said about word counting, but uh, for me, it would be important for my students to have an idea of what five lines look like. Because in third grade, some of them might have very big handwriting, some of them uh, small handwriting. So, and then you might start the paragraph using this line. My home country is Costa Rica. It is a country. It is a beautiful, it is a small, it is a whatever country they want to decide. Mm -hmm. So I'm offering also the deadlines, the first draft, second draft, and final version. We're going to work on two drafts and then the final version. Mm -hmm. And then the rubric is going to have this scale. I must acknowledge that this scale was actually um, created by my uh, regional advisor, Don Ezequiel Rojas, uh, together with David, which is the, or, or used to be, the person in charge of evaluation, the advisor for evaluation in our region. So you can see that actually we have the four different uh, points from one to four, but then we have a description of what once means, what two means, what four means. So for those of you who were at, uh, um, asking before, what does it mean to give a student a three or a four? Well, there you have the clear meaning uh, according to what MEB requires from us. And then here you see the criteria. So we actually have the topic sentence analysis, what the paragraph will be about. Even though we're giving the students the topic sentence and an idea of a topic sentence, we really want to um, see that it, it has the purpose. The body of the paragraph includes interesting details and clear examples of Costa Rica. And at the least, uh, the last sentence concludes the paragraph. So again, we're kind of rephrasing the task into the first paragraph and uh, the first draft. And the holistic checklist. The paragraph uh, is the paragraph format. Uh, it does it have lo long enough to fulfill the assignment? Was it turned in on time? And you see that it's three because we just have one for each, one point for each. Yes or no, you get a point or you don't get it. And of course, the, the part for teacher suggestions. I think it's important to notice that the major part of the grade is on the student's ideas, not on did they turn it in on time. That is important, but it's not more important than the ideas. So, just maybe take a minute to answer any. Get it back here. Right. Everybody's like, we're running out of time. So. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so the idea is uh, actually yes. I know you were having a lot of questions at the beginning. Like yes, that criteria that we saw at the beginning. How can I do it so I can it it can actually match what Matt is requiring me for me as a teacher. And yes, you can actually do it. You can define what those criteria are, what those points will be awarded, and what they mean. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the idea that we're trying to really emphasize here is when you design a writing task, you need to keep in mind the genre. What, what kind of writing is it? And the discourse markers. And when we say discourse markers, that is what makes a letter a letter. What makes a descriptive paragraph a descriptive paragraph. What makes a story a story. And then think about the grammar that students will need in order to be able to complete the assignment. If they're telling a story about their unforgettable day, they need grammar like past tense and past particip participle or past continuous, however you want to say it. Um, and what vocabulary do they need? If it's their unforgettable day, they need adjectives, lots of adjectives and feeling. And then good models, of course. We want to do the next slide. We're going to take a minute. We have more material than we have time for. So I'm asking Sam to just take a minute and think about what she wants to do. The, let's skip to how do you get feedback on grammar. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about how we can give feedback on content. I want to just spend just two or three minutes to talk about giving good feedback on grammar. So again, resist the temptation to try to correct students' grammar. Sometimes students get their papers back and there's red marks all over it. They won't learn if you fix it for them. If you tell them where the error is and what kind of error it is, they can fix it themselves. It's like you're the doctor diagnosing the problem and they are going to fix and heal themselves. Mm -hmm. So focus on the grammar that you've taught them in class. It is unfair to penalize a student if they use a semicolon incorrectly if you haven't yet taught them how to use a semicolon correctly. Mm -hmm. And remember that not every grammar error is equal, meaning that not every grammar error impedes comprehensibility. You can tolerate a certain level of grammar errors and still understand the text. Mm -hmm. okay. So I use symbols, the symbols that correspond to what students have been studying in their grammar books. I try not to do too many on any one draft. And I realize that some errors are not very important. You have to choose what is most important for your students and what they can understand and digest. So some common symbols that I use, of course, spelling, word choice, verb form, verb tense, capitalization. This is all going to depend on what you are working on in your class and your part of the curriculum. And again, try not to overwhelm students with the symbols. It should be their text. So you tell them you have, you know, this verb, this verb is in the wrong tense, and they fix it themselves. So here's an example of a rubric that I would like to give for the third draft. And I'm giving three grades. One grade for did they make the changes that I asked them to make in, in the sentence structure? Did they make the grammar and spelling changes I asked them to make? And did they add the details that I asked? Can I add something? Mm -hmm. um, I, again, when I see this rubric, we have to remember that we can also work with formative assessment, not only summative. Mm -hmm. So we can do something like this and work on students uh, doing it uh, qualitative. And so we're working with something like this, and it doesn't necessarily have to go to the grade. Right. So we don't have to, to worry about having all the definitions for that criteria because our students know this is very formative. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be summative. We won't have time to do this, but in an ideal world, what I would have you do is have you read your own story and for your own grammar. So just like Shirley did when she read her story out loud and she heard something that sounded weird and she fixed it. You should teach your students how to do this, how to read their stories out loud. If something feels strange to them, that's a cue that there's something going on that's not right, they can fix or revise. Um, so usually their hearing and their um, comprehension of oral text is better than their comprehension of written text. And then I have them read it backwards. Start with the last sentence. Is that a complete sentence? Go to the next. Is that a complete sentence? And so on. So your brain doesn't fill in the pieces for you. You're taking it out of context. Let's go to this. Yeah. So publishing. publishing. So let's say that you have gone through all the drafts with your students, you have these beautiful stories or texts that you're so proud of, what do you do with them, right? So ideally, there's so many things you can do, but a few suggestions from me. You have them read them to each other, read them to other students in the school, you can make a class book, 
you can share with parents or another class. If Jonathan and I are both teaching third grade, his third graders can come to my class and read their stories to my students, and my students can read their stories to his students. You, if you're writing a letter, have them send a letter. If it's a brochure, have them make the brochure. Find some way to share these texts with the world because your students have worked so hard on them. They've done three drafts, and they're ideally proud of the work they've done. So, what I would like for you to do today with your stories that you've shared and ones you haven't shared, we have created a space for you to share them and upload them. We want to publish our own stories. So please go to http slash slash bit.ly slash mech writing and share your stories with us. So write that down right now. We're going to move on, move the slide on. It's bit.ly backslash mech writing. It will take you to a Google document, and please be respectful because everybody has publishing privileges. <laughs> so it'll be a little chaotic, but I think it'll be really fun. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to go in and read each other's stories. Yeah. So, yeah. We can't wait. Your stories were amazing. I, I was so impressed with the stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The quality of the writing and the topics that people chose to write about were very meaningful. And I think um, that the prompt that was given, you know, you asked for something that had happened to you that was memorable. Mm -hmm. So I think that because it touches our own lives, there is a lot to say. And yeah. as you said, it has a lot of meaning. So uh, when we give uh, our learners uh, prompts, we need to think about that right. because that will make them write, right. Right? To, to really feel um, uh, connected right? Mm -hmm. to, to that task. Yes, exactly. Awesome. We already have six Yay, or seven Scarlett, there, thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's so great. easy when you write it on your computer, you just copy paste. Yes. Yeah, so absolutely. wonderful. And I have to be careful about not writing on top of other people, but we'll see how that works. This is beautiful chaos. <laughs> right now. Okay, let's come back to questions. Or is that what we're doing? I think we can go into questions or comments and yeah. then at uh, in about we'll have about 10 minutes and then we'll do feedback. Okay. Is that okay? Let's take a couple of questions. And we do have some questions in our um, somebody asked the word for onus. What does onus, onus mean? Onus means responsibility. It is your responsibility as the writer to communicate to the reader. So if, if I write something and you read it and you think, I don't get that, it's not your fault. It's not because you're a bad reader, it's because I'm a bad writer. This is cultural. A lot of cultures believe it's the reader's responsibility to read and interpret the text. In English writing, we believe the opposite. It's the writer's job to be clear to the reader. We respect the reader as someone who shouldn't have to work very hard. To do the to do the interpretation of the writing. Um, as a uh, question for the teachers here, what are some writing activities that you two do in your classes? Again, what are some writing activities that the two of you do in your classes? Well, um, right now I'm working with. Uh, if I think about um, the old curriculum, for example, last year with uh, sixth graders. Uh, no, the year before, with sixth graders, what I did was uh, pen polling. So I found people from the states who work in, a, in, in an, an elementary school, and we were exchanging letters, actual letters. It took us the whole year, but the first thing we did was uh, we created the letters in my school, my students, and then I sent the package to the states. It took a couple of weeks, they got it, they read it, and they replied back. So it was real interaction with real people. Um, and that they love that activity. I did the same this year with fifth graders, but within the school. So one uh, group, for example, five one, they wrote letters introducing themselves to five two, and five two to five three, and so on and so forth. Then they were exchanging letters. So I was the mailman, and I was like, "Oh, I have mail for you." And they had a, a, a really great time doing that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, how about for you, what are sure, sure, sure. some sort of activities you do in the classroom you ready? <laughs> okay, we'll come back. Yeah. Someone asked if this information, the slides would be available. Yes, the slides, the whole presentation 
Everything that we've done today will be available in the um, resource folders that Mary's showing you right now. Yeah, it's this. And this webinar, the, the recording of it will be available mm -hmm. to you. I want to add something, um, Sam. They are saying that if what we were presenting today is useful for elementary schools mm -hmm. and it is. And the examples that were given are for sixth grade. Oh, sorry, of course, we are not grade. there yet. Mm -hmm. We are not there yet. We have the first writing goal in third grade, but there they are writing very short messages. Right. In sixth grade, we have goals, and in fifth grade, where they have to write paragraphs, as the ones that were presented today. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, since first grade, they begin like writing uh, very short texts. Uh, but as they move on, they will begin going through the process that she was showing today. So it's very relevant for the new English curriculum. The new English curriculum goes step by step, little by little, until they are able to come out with very uh, uh, structured, I would say, as, yeah. as Samantha was showing today, uh, paragraphs. So I remember once, uh, well, in the literature class that I have, uh, I asked the students, they are in eighth grade, and they should create their own story, like a short story. They had to use a lot of hyperboles and similes yeah. and all that, because we were seeing those elements. Mm -hmm. And it was very fun, very fun. They enjoyed it a lot. They were very creative. I was very surprised how creative they can become. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I want to share with the first graders last year. Um, I actually wanted to introduce somehow the decision making on writing, and so they had to create this uh, town of their own. So they had to do the drawings and everything, and then on the board I wrote like this is the, and all the different uh, places around town that we had studied that they could read from, right? We had practiced them, they already knew more or less how to identify. Mm -hmm. So they were like, oh, I want a bank. So they were writing, this is the bank, and then they drew a bank of their town. Mm -hmm. So it's that decision-making right. process and that kind of brainstorming, because first we started all together, what places can we have in a town? Mm -hmm. And I wrote them on the board. Right. And then, okay, now it's your turn to decide what do you want to write about in your ideal town, right? And the vocabulary that accompanies that are things that are really useful in the students' lives to know what a bank is, what a fire station is, where the mayor works. All of the vocabulary that they will discover throughout the process of this writing task is valuable vocabulary and useful for them, mm -hmm. ideally. <laughs> um, Anna, could you address something about the reading and writing in elementary school? Well, uh, in terms of the reading and writing in elementary schools, remember that we are working, uh, we are moving the students to level A1 uh, in the Common European Framework of Reference. So in first grade, we will begin with phonemic awareness as we discussed yesterday, where they are exposed to the sounds of English. Um, and they begin with what we call choral reading. So they are exposed to very short uh, stories that they listen and they repeat. You can have charts on the board if you want with that text so that students get exposure also to the writing. They can also dictate words for the teacher to write in their drawings if they create drawings so that if they, if they uh, with a drawing, they say a story, they can request for words to complete that. Uh, as Jonathan was saying, when we are working uh, even uh, on uh, speaking, we can have some uh, sentence frames that we can write like I am, I have uh, a car or a doll or something like that so that they can get the, the, the notion of how the sentences are written. Of course, they are not writing that. They are still not producing. In second grade, we move to work writing. They begin printing words to complete a sentence or to, to match a drawing with, um, with a word. In third grade, they begin writing. They begin writing words. And we also move 
with more complexity into reading because through phonetic awareness, they are in second grade connecting sounds with letters and then they begin blending those sounds and letters to read the words, to read the sentences. At the end of third grade, they, they are expected to write short uh, messages, right? Uh, like a birthday card, like a very short description of an object. Even the one we gave about Costa Rica, what they are saying is hello, something that they already know from first grade, second grade. My name is, I am from. Okay, so we are recycling. Yeah. I just want to put out there, we have the feedback slides up on Menometer. Please answer them. We're going to move forward through them in the next five minutes while Anna's talking. But please look at your Mentimeter and answer. We need that feedback to offer both the MEP and the embassy. So please answer. Thanks. All right. right. And um, in uh, the second cycle, we continue. In the second cycle, they already know how to decode the words. They can read very simple things and they can write very simple things. And from then on, we begin progressing through fourth, fifth, until sixth grade, where at the end of sixth grade, they, they can write uh, simple paragraphs, very simple, of course, but uh, maybe 100 words or 75 words, we don't, as Sam said, we do not recommend to begin counting words, that, that was, her recommendation, but that's something that gives you an idea of what the children can produce. Of course, this demands a lot of exposure to reading as well, right? Nice texts. Um, we are working now in the production of mini books, stories that can accompany the implementation of the curriculum so that children can have access to texts that are more contextualized to Costa Rica. That, that, that are from, from Costa Rica. So uh, that's what I have to say in regards to Mary's question on, on how we see from the perspective of the, this curriculum, reading and writing. They go hand in hand. That is very important. They go hand in hand. Uh, the last question for us to talk about today is, how do you motivate students to write? How do you motivate yeah. students to write? And again, please go to your Mentimeter and fill in our feedback. We have another four minutes and we really do, we know that there are over 200 people out there, so we'd really love to get your feedback on, on this work. I think the first thing for me to help motivate students is write an authentic text prompt. Write an authentic task. A task that students can see that they could use in their daily life, like the write an email to your teacher. At some point in your life, you're going to have to write an email to your teacher, so you might as well learn how to do it the right way or a way that is effective, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the best tasks are authentic tasks, um, things that students will be can see this is practical. Even a third grader wants to have something that's practical for them, right? Um, and then I think my second criteria is something that the students are allowed to contribute their own experience and personality, um, some part of their life story, or to share, like you were saying, the brochures of where they're from or creating their own town. Something where they feel like they have ownership of it um, and some sort of control over the topic, a variety of topics maybe. But I think, you know, authenticity I think is key and ownership for them to be able to put part of their own personality into it. Um, often academic writing seems like it doesn't have a lot of personality, but really you're creating an argument and you're putting forth your own ideas. You just have to do it in a way that sounds like it's not so much your opinion. So that's for advanced, obviously, for advanced writing. But that's my take. Other panelists, what do you want to say about motivation? I think children um, need to see that teachers like writing. Yes. If they don't you see I like writing, love writing. If, if that I is go, so true. Yeah, yeah, if I go to the classroom and I'm like, okay, today we're going to be doing some writing, take your pen and pencil. <laughs> yeah. So. so we need to be very encouraging and they need to see like, oh, I love writing and this is why writing yes. is important and they're going to love it Sometimes well. they ask me, why do you like that? And I'm like, because it's so cool, it's so yes. nice. <laughs> You're communicating with the world, really, yeah. you know. I think one way to make writing fun and motivate people is to change the, the genre in actually a very different way. I have seen um, 
Somebody make, for example, they, they take a sample of a poem, but then they cut it up in pieces of paper and they kind of hang it and, and then they make it into a mobile, for yes, example. Yes. So you take writing outside of just a piece of paper make that they're looking at and make it three dimensional or make it creative. Make a dice, for example, and create a story that you roll the dice and you have to find the story, something like that. You know, like trying to take writing off of just being on the paper. Mm -hmm. And um, the more I do that, it's so much more fun. I have a favorite book about teaching writing, and, mm -hmm. and I use it with children and adults. It's called, If You're Gonna Teach Kids to Write, You've Gotta Have This Book. And it's true. <laughs> it's a book, that, and this is where I got a lot of my writing ideas. Um, it's called, it's by Marjorie Frank. And it's called, If You're Gonna Teach Kids to Write, You've Gotta Have This Book. <laughs> and she's phenomenal. I was thinking maybe we could, I don't know if she's still working, but she would be an interesting person to bring to Costa Rica. Uh, because she really makes writing come alive. Um, you can make writing games. You could have like a poem or something on the board and have kids run to the board and write you know, two words in the sentence and then they run back and you do this running dictation creativity thing. Yes. Um, and I think the idea that you tell your students, we're going to be sharing this. This is something we're going to be offering, we're going to share with our parents, we're going to share with our classmates, we're going to share with students in the United States. So they know that it's going to be published, it's going to be special. Yes, that's true because uh, right now in our high school, well, the national advisors asked us to save everything, all the works from the students, so they can publish it in the MEX mm -hmm. website. When I tell them that, they become very excited. Yeah. 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 And I think the idea that we have in elementary school of the mini books, you have to try that as much as you can because it's personalized. Right. Right. So it's something that each student is writing about himself or herself. So it's very meaningful, and as um, our teachers and colleagues are recommended here, it should not just stay with the kid, but it's something that should be exhibited, it, it should be something that should be shared, right. so that even with other schools, yeah. it could be a project where they share those stories with other children in other schools, and so that makes it more exciting, and that might motivate them more to write. And something very important, we need to read and we need to encourage children to read as well, because it, I think to be a good writer, we need to be a good reader as well, right? Because that also uh, give us more creativity, more words, and all that. That, that. that helps a lot as well, yeah. So we need to finish up. I want to add one other piece about motivation, because I think it's important. And I was so excited in the beginning of the webinar when we saw people that consider themselves writers. And, um, I think one of the best ways you can motivate your students to write is for you to love writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you, actually let's switch. Okay. Let's switch. Um, if, you, if you love writing, and then you can get that energy out. It doesn't mean that they're gonna love it, but it makes a huge difference. If you don't like writing, if you hate writing, if you think you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, all, all your, who you are and your attitude and energy will come out in your class. You teach who you are. When I became a writing teacher, I was horrified because I hated writing. I thought, how am I gonna teach? I can't do it. And I forced myself to do research and find, that's how I found my favorite books, and I forced myself to learn how to fall in love with writing so that I could be a teacher that loved what she was teaching. Um, and, and so I'm, you know, I can't force you to love writing. I can't force you to say, oh, I'm a writer, to develop your identity as a writer. But I think that that's a huge piece of motivation for students is, is who you are as a teacher. So it's something for us to think about. Right? Um, you'll see in your Mentimeter we've got a thank you slide, and I really want to thank uh, first of all, Sam Parks for joining us for these three weeks. It's such a pleasure. I love hearing the stories. I can't wait to read more of them on the document. Please take two or three minutes after this webinar is over. If you have written yours on pen and paper, type it up and put it in the document so we can share it all together. I shared my plane crash story with you all, so I want to hear your stories as well. Yeah. I want to thank um, our national advisors that are with us today and those that are not with us today. So we have Anna and Jaudi and Alfredo and Marianella um, that did a lot of the work with the regional advisors and the technical people to make this happen. So thank you all very much. Yeah, yeah. And thank you. I want to say thank you, Sam, 
so very much for taking this challenge of, of helping us with the webinars. And they have been very uh, successful, I think, teachers, and Mary as well, mm -hmm. because we have been exposed to Mentimeter. That's something new for yeah. the Costa Rican context. And now even you can try it with your students as well. And, uh, and besides that, we, are, we were learning about technology the first day, uh, screen casting, how to create videos, to give feedback to students, and any other, other ideas that you might have about how to use it. We also had yesterday a um, pronunciation, and we were working with the color vowel chart, which is a resource free that is online that can help you improve your own pronunciation and also help students. Since elementary school, a lot of ideas were given by Jonathan and by Shirley, and today with this very nice workshop on the process of writing. So thank you so very much, Mary Scholl, for your support for your coordination as well, uh, for innovating. I think uh, also this way in which the webinar was given is, is different, and it's a way to innovate, to try new things in terms of how to give a, a webinar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and thank you to my other colleagues that are not here, Marianela and Alfredo, that they were also with us since in, through the whole process, right? And uh, we hope to continue having these activities for you teachers in order to all of us learn, all of us improve and create this community of learning as we move on in the implementation of the new English curriculum. So thank you for your participation. That is something so exciting when we listen to you, when we hear what you are doing, your stories. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I want to also a big thank you to Shirley and Jonathan. Yes. Thank you guys. because all of this really is possible thanks to the U.S. Embassy. Now you guys, just quickly before you go, we can't, you can't uh, clap, we can't hear you clapping, but you can see you shaking your hands, so thank you very much to everybody who showed up. You guys do a big, this is a thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, we and hope it helps. Thank you for hosting. Thank you for yes. hosting. The person that is here helping us with the uh, camera and all that. Yeah. Have a great week and weekend almost. Yeah. End of week. Bye-bye.